Welcome to the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology. This is a lecture on the topic of management practices. This is part of the subject Agronomy 1. This subject is taught in the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology and the Bachelor of Equine Studies. These degrees are both offered at Melbourne Polytechnic, with the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology being a partnership with La Trobe University. To find out about more about our courses, please go to our website at www.melbournepolytechnic.edu.au. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. In Lecture 8, we will look at management practices. We will start with cropping and cropping management. I will give an overview followed by a typical timetable, what you might do through the year. We will look at physiological uh, practices and the philosophy behind them. We will touch on crop rotations, nutrient management, water management, soil management and tailoring irrigation for crops. When you do any kind of farming, it can be backed by a philosophy. One of the more important philosophies that we talk about across this de degree is that of sustainable practices and is certainly a good place to introduce such practices. The Australian agricultural scientist Gordon McLeod introduced sustainable practices to cropping in a paper submitted in July 2009. Sustainable agriculture is the act of farming using the principles of ecology, the study of relationships between organisms and their environment. So we will look at both sustainable practices and other practices used in Australian cropping here. The image on your screen is an example of a typical management timetable that I have compiled. Principally, when you are constructing such a timetable, you are combining your phenological knowledge, that is the stage of a plant development, with the inputs and processes that you need to combine with your crop growth in order to optimise your commercial output. For example, when growing wheat, you start with the preparation of the soil or paddock. For example, you might look at weed control strategies, you might conduct soil tests. <coughs> you would then look at sowing. How are you going to sow? What are your sowing densities? What nutrients or fungicides may you add? When will you sow? You might then look at disease and pest monitoring, and you might have to do this all the way through the season. That will enable an effective control plan to be implemented. You may also have to look at weed monitoring, particularly before the crop gets established. Weed monitoring and correct identification of weeds will help in the control. You may wish to monitor crop fertilisers. Do you need to add more as the season progresses? You can do this by looking at plant indicators or sending off plant samples. While your plants are growing through the season, you may also want to be checking grain prices and how will that influence your management strategies. You might also need to organise and prepare your harvesting equipment and organise, if required, your grain storage facilities. You may need to estimate your yield. You will then have to harvest and think about logistics. Are you going to deliver or store your grain? <clears throat> How are you going to organise your invoices and payments? So, as you can see, there is quite a lot to do in the management of a particular paddock. The timetable that I put above is for just one crop. If you are running a farm, you are likely to have several crops. You need to think about aligning your other crops around the equipment availability, your ideal sowing time. You may be trying to sow for rain, but if you leave it too late, frost may hit. So you need to balance. To help with the complexities, it is often to use, useful to set out such a timetable as the one I have constructed above, and you would need to do this for each season. If you keep good records and you cross-reference your years and your seasons, you will allow, it will allow you to learn more and remember correctly from season to season. This will make your enterprise more efficient. In the next few slides, we are going to overview 
the major management practices in agronomy. The objective is to give you a rounded but not detailed view of the aspects of agronomy. Let us begin with rotations. Rotations are where you plant different crops in different years. They are used as disease breaks, they enable the addition of organic matter, you can put nitrogen into your soil by the use of legumes and they can improve the carbon condition of your soil. A rotation usually involves a different genus each year for a set of years, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four. Rotations are considered essential for sustainable long-term cropping. Not only does it allow you to, to balance your nutrients in your soil, but also reduces the build-up of disease. In the long term, this keeps down your costs. To sustainably manage soil environments, you have to use a combination of techniques and knowledge. It is perhaps one of the greatest challenges that agronomists have, but if you get your sustainable soil management right, you will not only be able to keep using that soil for many years, but you will probably increase your productivity and reduce your costs and inputs. How do we do this? Well, we start by understanding our soil. So we need to ask ourselves questions like, what is the soil type? What is its structure? Is it predominantly sand or predominantly clay? Or some other mixture of these two? What is the pH of the soil? What is the salinity of the soil? Are there any contaminants in the soil? And how much nutrients does this particular soil contain? A lot of this information can be obtained from soil testing. You can then use these results to adjust your fertilizer rates, improving your fertilizer efficiency and reducing your costs. Soil history can also aid in this information, particularly those of fertiliser and chemical records and records of previous management practices. Conventional soil management involved many times the, the field was ploughed. However, we have moved away from this to a strategy of predominantly no-till or minimum till. This results in little cultivation which is effective for our fertiliser management and also our herbicides. Australia has many heavy soils and you can use gypsum for physical characteristics such as slacking or crusting. Slacking is where the breakdown of a large air-dried soil aggregate from 2 to 5 millimetres into smaller sized micro aggregates, so that's less than 0.25 of a millimetre, when they are suddenly immersed in water. Slacking occurs when aggregates are not strong enough to withstand internal stresses caused by the rapid water uptake. Internal stresses result from the differential swelling of clay particles tapped and escaped air in the soil pores, rapid release of heat during wetting and the mechanical action of moving water. The impacts of these characteristics can be reduced with the addition of gypsum. If your soil is slightly acidic, you can adjust by the pH by adding lime. These are two common practices of soil management in Australia. Nutrients are essential for plant growth. Nutrients are usually delivered in cropping systems via fertilisers. There are a wide range of soils in Australia but typically they tend to be phosphorus deficient. Nitrogen is also a common fertiliser added to Australian soils and this can be found predominantly in three forms, MAP, DAP or urea. We are conducting some experiments on urea in the Yang Ying Teaching and Research Demonstrator which you will have become familiar with while doing this subject. Potassium is commonly used too on Australian soils and some of the local deficiencies we have is zinc 
manganese and sulfur. They are large economic inputs for crops. Another management practice is that of irrigation. This tends to be used for specialised crops where the economic value is worth the infrastructure cost. Breeding programs and bulking up from mother seed have reduced the need for irrigation on some crops, but can also increase its efficiency. It is often stated that weed, pest and disease control is perhaps the single biggest cost that farmers have to deal with. It is important for you to understand the following. Have a good idea of what the weeds, pests and disease are for your district, your farm and your paddock. Accurate identification and early identification can greatly assist in the management of your weeds, pests and disease and in the long run reduce costs and chemicals that you apply. It is absolutely essential that you know the life cycles of the crops that you are growing. This affects control and timing and effective chemicals and costs. For example, some weed, weed killers you would only spray at two leaf stage and if you let the, weed, the, the weeds develop further and then sprayed, it would be ineffective. Be aware of the weather conditions and how they may impact on the more common fungal diseases and pests. For example, this winter recently we had a warm spell followed by a high moisture, humidity and rainfall content. These are ideal com um, conditions for rust and around many of the regions uh, outbreaks of rust have indeed been seen by the local farmers. It is important to ascertain when a plant or a weed or an animal is, is of an, an economic concern. Just because a few weeds are in your paddock doesn't mean to say they will impact significantly on your crop. The control of mice, locusts and ryegrass need special consideration. And you need to understand about resistance. Particularly resistance to control measures. And how this may impact on the control measures that you select and your crop. It is important to get your harvesting correct. You need to know the specifications of your particular crop. For example, some grain crops require the grain to be harvested when the moisture is below a certain percent, say 15 or 12 percent, when your protein is above or within a range, and where your screenings are acceptable. Different treatments for different crops. So wind drone form canola, draper front for peas, different handling for faber beans and lentils. This needs to reflect your infrastructure as well. Harvesting can be and is often done by contractors. Some of the machinery is expensive and this may be a more economically viable way for you to ha handle and harvest your crop. After horse, uh, harvest, you then have to consider storage. This can take two forms. You can store on your farm or you can store off the farm. Storage on the farm usually involves silos or bunkers. They need to be clean and they need to be sealed to prevent for insect damage. You need to have good recording systems in place for your storage records. Off farm, involves chemical sites which are often placed near railways. There are also warehousing options that occur but these may come at an extra expense. Technology and agronomy is advancing at a very rapid rate. I will just give an overview of technology here. However, we do offer a subject agricultural technologies which goes into further detail about the new agricultural technologies that are emerging in the industry. So perhaps the most common that's used currently is GPS or Global Positioning Systems. This is technology that enables you to locate an area. 
This is very important for keeping records and for allowing automation of some processes such as the auto steerer. You can have a herbicide application via boom sprays, variable fertilizer application. This is very exciting and does allow sustainable agronomy, sustainable soil management and once the infrastructure is in place has significant economic benefits. Yield napping is another important technology which has been advancing in several years. This is where you take samples at known locations and then produce a 3D map. Yield mapping tends to come under the umbrella of precision agriculture, as does variable fertiliser applications. Another consideration where technology is aided and that is in tram lining. This is where the same tracks are used for every pass. You need to match up equipment. And finally, genetically modified crops. This is a significant advancement in the area of modern agricultural but it does come at a cost. There are some groups and some consumers that are against this and therefore you really need to know your market before you embark on such crops. The following image is of an air seeder and demonstrates some of the new and exciting technologies that are available to farmers. Organic agronomy, or more commonly known as organic farming, is the practical application of a farming system and associated management that should be founded on building soil humus. All activities of the farm will centre around the conversion of existing organic matter into st stable humus. In modern organic farming, farmers work with natural soil processes like nitrogen fixation in legumes and work out how best to utilise nutrients from each crop. Organic farming yields can be below conventional production. However, this is not always the situation and there are certainly examples of farmers that yield greater. Organic farming does require a rigid or um, autumn audited system and there are seven accreditors that operate across Australia. One of the criticisms of organic farming is that there are so many accreditors and that they require slightly different specifications. There is also a view of the, from the general public. They see organic farming as something that is very holistic and many consumers are prepared to pay extra. This is how farmers will compensate for initial low yields. There is an increasing body of evidence for organic farms that have been along, in existence for many, many years, such as some of the first organic farms that came out of the US, that do require an MPK addition after about 10, 15 years of practice. However, the amount of MPK that had been placed on that farm over that period is much, much less than those of an or conventional farm. During the period of this MPK, the farm becomes non-organic or non-certified. Two years will pass and then certification will be granted assuming all other criteria is met. There are a body of farmers that do take on the philosophy of minimal inputs and sustainable farming and while they are not farming as an organic farmer in a certified way they are certainly taking on board many of the principles. Now let us look at the markets. It is important to familiarise yourself with the markets and they essentially fall into domestic and export. In the domestic markets for agronomy, this tends to be a mixture of for human consumption, such as bread, biscuits, noodles, malt, breakfast cereals, stock feed for stock such as poultry, pigs, feedlots, dairy, sheep, manufacturing for ethanol production and polymers, and manufacturing for pharmaceutical industries. 
Often the pharmaceutical industries do require the planting of specially genetically modified or GM plants and you need to understand the components of this. Whatever particular market you choose to aim at, ensure that you are aware of the pathway to market. That is, can you sell your crop? How do you sell it? And who, have, who are you able to sell it to? These are important considerations, particularly if you are trying a new crop. The second group is the export market. There are many countries we export to, the Middle East to countries like Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Jordan, Turkey and Syria, Japan, China, Malaysia, Indonesia and South Korea. There is significant competition for our exports against the US, Canada and Argentina. Therefore the supplies in these countries, as well as the exchange rate, can significantly import, impact on export markets. Some considerations, the end product, there may be different specifications for various breads and noodles in other countries. Pest and weed seeds need to be considered and sometimes you can, they can vary during shipping so they can start off at an exceptionally good quality and due to the container and the shipping transport time be a lower quality when they arrive at their destination. Also some of these countries require specific paperwork so you need to know what countries and what paperwork before you go down this avenue. Other considerations for marketing are storage and logistics. Australia is a large country and it is very expensive to transport on road so you need to consider other transports such as rail and boat. The demise of small delivery points. More and more of small delivery points have closed down, so therefore the distance between each delivery point is greater and this will impact on, on costs. Different markets have different specifications, so what do you want to sell and who do you want to sell it to? Grain traders versus single desk need to monitor prices closely and understand marketing tools. And then there is the future markets. This is where you forward sell, that is, you sell the crop before it's ready. And you undertake a legal contract. contract. You are locking in prices, but you are also locking in a, a, a quality and a productivity of that quality. So what is the future of agronomy? Well, it's a complex future that we face. There is certainly a growing population and with this growing world population there will be a need for more food. So how can we deliver this? How are we able to meet these demands? Also in the future you would hope that we obtain greater yields and better efficiencies. We reduce our water nutrients requirements but um, optimise such inputs as the sun. Then there are the environmental concerns. This is climate change and possibly the use of um, genetically modified materials. This will largely depend on consumer preference. And there is great potential for specialised production. These are such systems as hydroponics for cereals, for example. When you start off your career as agronomy, one of the most important things that you can do is build up a body of knowledge. There are many textbooks available for agronomists that will help you gain this knowledge. Also, the Department of Primary Industries that are um, located all over Australia are exceptionally good resources for Australian farmers. I have put on the slide the website for DPI that leads to the crop section and crop production. You will notice that all of the crops are separated and there are specific management aspects and considerations. You may also look at the WA DPI, New South Wales DPI and the DPI for Queensland. 
The research funding bodies, such as the Grain and Research and Development Corporation, are also exceptionally good uses of knowledge and information. Universities and agricultural websites also offer additional information for management. This brings us to the end of the lecture on agronomy management practices. This lecture has been a very basic overview of agronomy. I have covered the major management practices. We started by familiaring ourselves with crop timing and the seasonal aspects that are specific to Australia. We discussed sustainable soil management and the practices that it incurs. We've also looked at the philosophy of low input science based farming. That is, you measure and you interpret your results and you optimise your resource input based on your measured measurements. We've looked at the most significant inputs in agronomy. These are nutrients, water, pest and disease control. And we finished off by examining the markets, the future and where you can obtain information. This brings us to the end of this